Hi everyone, Spartanburger here. Having used Source Filmmaker for quite some time now, I've been wondering how to make my projects render faster. So, I decided to sit down and find out by testing various render settings to find what affects the time it takes to render each frame. I rendered out a very short video here. It's only 5 seconds long, nothing too fancy. I rendered it about 30 times uh, in a number of different batches. And within each batch, I changed a couple of settings and pulled the pull frame, uh, the per frame render data from the config file that was created alongside the render. And these are the results that I found. The main factors to consider when trying to improve render time are the SFM underscore resolution launch option, the output resolution, the motion blur and depth of field passes, and output file type. So that shouldn't exactly come as a surprise to anyone who has used source formaker before. However, since I've seen a lot of misinformation on render times, particularly on the subreddit, I thought the little details for each factor would be interesting to share. The SFM resolution launch option is what people use in order to render a movie in a resolution higher than 1280 by 720 You simply add the maximum resolution you want to be able to render, i.e. 1080 for 1920 by 1080 and that option will now show up in the resolution selection window when exporting as a movie. However, a higher SFM resolution launch option will generally mean a longer render time, regardless of what resolution you actually export at. With SFM resolution set to 2160, rendering at 3840 by 2160 took, on average, 2.24 seconds per frame, whereas 1920 by 1080 and 960 by 540 were within a margin of error at 2.06 and 2.8 seconds, 2.08 seconds, sorry, respectively. Drop SFM resolution down to 1080 and the 1920 by 1080 frame time drops down to 1.19 seconds per frame, while 960 by 540 remains within a margin of error at 1.2 seconds per frame. Finally, if you remove the launch option entirely, 960 by 540 takes 1.16 seconds per frame. The thing to note here is that the launch option has a significant effect on your export times, even when rendering well below the resolution that the launch option is set to. In fact, it is better off to remove the launch option entirely if you're not exporting at the resolutions that need it. Uh, by the way, I specifically chose those resolutions because each one is exactly one quarter the size as the next resolution up. Uh, see the examples on screen now. I should also point out that, and this will be especially noticeable in lower-end hardware, a higher SFM resolution launch option has a significant effect on smoothness when editing. I'm not 100% sure why this is the case, but I think it has something to do with the game engine actually running at that resolution in the background while editing. So even if your viewport is small, like this, having SFM resolution set to 2160 is effectively running it in 4K in the background. So you should really only have the launch option enabled when you're ready to do a final render. The next thing I tested was motion blur and depth of field. I've seen a lot of misinformation about these two settings, particularly about how one has a much larger effect on render time than the other. So my goals here were to check uh, to see what the difference actually was and what the effect was of increasing the number of passes. Big shock here, more passes means longer render time. In fact, render time almost increases perfectly with the number of passes. More surprisingly, however, rendering with both enabled had no statistical difference on render time. For a motion blur with depth of field turned off, 0 passes took 0.12 seconds per frame, 16 passes took 0.33 seconds per frame, 64 passes took 1.17 seconds per frame, and 256 passes took 4.45 seconds per frame. For depth of field with motion blur turned off, 0 passes took 0.12 seconds per frame, 16 passes took 0.33 seconds per frame, 64 passes took 1.14 seconds per frame, 256 passes took 4.44 seconds per frame, and 1,024 passes took 17.51 seconds per frame. Um, that's kind of long. So, motion blur and depth of field do not have any statistically significant differences between them on render time. In fact, with 64 passes of both motion blur and depth of field, the average frame time was 1.16 seconds, compared to 1.14 seconds of just depth of field, and 1.17 uh, seconds of just motion blur. So, both motion blur and depth of field have an equal effect and a non-interfering effect on render times. This is because the rendering technique for motion blur and depth of field re-renders each frame and merges it with the previous passes in order to create the new, Im the new image for the final frame. Or something like that. I'm not 100% sure on that either. If you have 64 passes of motion blur and only 8 passes of depth of field, it's still re-rendering the frame 64 times, so you may as well have 64 passes of both. It won't affect your render time.
Now, of course, more passes will always mean higher quality, but you do get a significantly reduced rate of return on quality for the time invested as you add more and more passes. But whatever number of passes you decide is acceptable for your render, have, make sure you have motion blur and depth of field set to the same number so you're having an efficient use of your render time. Finally, render file type. I rendered out in five different ways. As an uncompressed AVI, an uncompressed MP4, and as PNG, JPEG, and TGA image sequences. A TGA image sequence ended up being the fastest render, but an important thing to remember with image sequences is that you have to re-render them in post before you can actually do anything with them. And because of each frame is its own image, uh, file sizes can be quite large. PNG image sequences took the longest time to render at 1.84 seconds per frame. Each frame ended up being 1.07 megabytes in size, so the total render size was 129 megabytes. The next one down was an uncompressed AVI at 1.26 seconds per frame. Because it was already a video file, no further rendering was needed, and the final video size was 316 megabytes. Then there was the JPEG image sequence at 1.23 seconds per frame. This one was actually really interesting to me because, and this is to be expected for JPEG compression, each file was only 0.11 megabytes in size, and all 120 frames of the video ended up being only 12.6 megabytes. And when I rendered it in post, Adobe Premiere almost rendered it in real time too, which is way faster than the other image sequences. I'm not sure if this is, it has anything to do with the JPEG compression itself being easy to read, or if it was just the file size, or if it was the read speeds of the hard drive, but it was all very significant. Next up was an uncompressed MP4 at 1.2 seconds per frame. However, this file type had the largest total size out of them all at 421 megabytes. Finally, as I mentioned before, the TGA image sequence was the fastest at 1.18 seconds per frame but it also took up the most hard drive space out of all of the image sequences at 2.63 megabytes per file and 316 megabytes in total. So if you're looking to just render as fast as possible and assemble it later in post, render as a TGA image sequence. If you want to just render quickly to get something like a work in progress ready as soon as possible, render as an MP4 as an AVI. So to summarize, only have SFM resolution launch options set up when you're exporting and only when exporting at resolutions larger than the default resolution camp. Fewer passes for motion blur and depth of field will take less time, but whatever amount you choose, make sure it's the same for both depth of field and motion blur so you get the most out of your render time. Finally, render as a TGA image sequence and assemble in post. There are other factors that I tested in order to see what their effect was, but aside that they weren't really worth getting into too much on details. Subpixel jitter anti-aliasing has a negligible effect on render time, so just leave it on. Although ambient occlusion has a, has a significant effect on render time, it also has a significant effect on render quality, and the only reason why you would want to turn it off is if you're dealing with models that don't have it enabled anyway. As for my testing methodology, I closed most programs while rendering, and the only thing I had running in the background were Steam, Notepad, and my antivirus softwares, which I didn't really want to shut down, and I couldn't really be bothered figuring out how to shut down. Actually, no, I knew how to shut them down, I was just lazy. Unless it was a factor that I was testing, I always tested with no launch options, rendering at 1280 by 720, 24 frames per second, 64 passes of both motion blur and depth of field, ambient occlusion on, subpixel jitter anti-aliasing on, and exporting as a TGA image sequence. Hardware also can have a huge effect on render times as well. I would have liked to have tested a variety of processors and graphics cards to determine how hardware has an effect on render time, but I don't have a hardware inventory or the whole money thing, so I could only test my current setup, which is an FX 6300 CPU, 16 gigabytes of RAM, and an R9390 uh, GPU. So yeah, there you go, some easy methods of increasing your render time. I hope you enjoyed, if you liked this video, good for you, and if you want to see more, too bad, because this channel is inconsistent as fuck.